Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake. I'm your host, Reza Aslan. <sighs> Did it work? Is this 2022? What are you doing? What's going on? Rain? This is rain from the future. It's future rain. And I've got to deliver a super important message to you. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is so cool. So like, wait, how far in the future are you? I mean, are, is, are like people flying around in hoverboards and stuff? No, 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 no hoverboards. Listen, no, I've, I've got to deliver this very specific message Oh my God, you. I know it. So, it's about, it's about micro, microwaves, right? They, they make food cold in the future instead of hot. Reza, that's a refrigerator. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, but I mean, they make it cold faster is what I, what I meant to say. That's a freezer. This is not working. Just lay it on me. Lay it on me. Do not call Trump a piece of shit. You will get fired from CNN. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me right now? That was like four years ago. I thought you were going to give me like stock tips. You could have gone to 2012 me and told me to invest in Bitcoin. Sorry. Speaking of the future, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today may be the perfect person to talk about the future and the future of futurism. Wait, what happens to Bitcoin? Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Cass Media and Soul Pancake. All right. Well, you're absolutely no good when it comes to the future. Uh, fortunately, we do have somebody who can actually help us navigate this rather heady topic of what will the future be like? Yes, our guest is Jane McGonigal. She is called the current public face of gamification. She's got her PhD from UC Berkeley. In 2008, she became the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future. Can you believe there's a place called the Institute for the Future? She's written so many uh, great books, including uh, Reality is Broken, all about gaming. But her new one is so exciting. It's called Imaginable, How to See the Future Coming and Be Ready for Anything. Please give an ice-cold, milkshaking welcome to Jane McGonigal. Jane, we filmed a silly little kind of comedy sketch for TED Talks way back when, like eight years ago, something like that. Yes, and that is literally the only comedic scene I've ever filmed. So thank you for like helping me check off a bucket list of doing comedy with an all-time comedy great. Oh, I mean, well, amazing. stop. You were fantastic, by the way. It was from me, me, Rain Wilson, was dating these TED Talks, and I, I fell in love with her. TED Talk. And it's very meta. But um, listen, you've got a new book out, Imaginable. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff here today. And um, it's about futurism. I don't, I don't, I know, I'm sure that's not a word you like to use, but predicting the future and what possibilities the future hold. But here I am, here we are recording this <laughs> a week into the invasion of the Ukraine. Since you're a futurist, Jane, is this the beginning of World War III? I think it ends better than it started, although um, that tends to be my default. I think it's a wake-up call. I mean, if, you know, I really think what it will lead to is rapid abandoning of fossil fuels because I think what we're, what so many nations are realizing is they don't want to be dependent on Russia for gas anymore. And so I think in the long run, it'll be good, really, really good for climate action. I don't know. I do, I do t tend to look at even the, the most difficult realities as a, as a possible path forward to something better. That's my annoyingly optimistic <laughs> default well, setting. Well, I, I like that. And, you know, and also here we have an excellent example uh, in under horrific circumstances of the world kind of really coming together um, it, it, at least with its economic policies, and willing to take a hit at the gas tank and at oil prices and, and in various other economic ways to economically punish another country, the most I've ever seen that in my adult life. Um, and that is, there's something positive about that, that the world can move against a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of countries be more welcoming to refugees than they have in the past. and. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, they're white refugees. Yeah, that's, I mean, so let's be. <laughs> they're white refugees who are driving their Volvos to the border. They're white, so white refugees, yes. they're more than welcome to come in. Yes, and um, 
One of the futures that I spend a lot of time imagining is the future of climate migration. And I do think one of the most important challenges for the next decade or two is for all of us to prepare to welcome people who have to move um, because the climate where they live no longer Mm -hmm. supports um, human life. And even though this current acceptance of refugees is founded in racism and feeling comfortable with white Christian refugees, even so, it may set a template or model for being more welcoming and maybe living through the experience of having this welcoming and realizing that it's not something to fear. And, you know, for I have seven-year-old daughters and I hope that they will see this and see see how heroic it is to welcome others and and that we'll have a generation grow up being less scared of yeah. of migrants. Um I, you know, again, it's I never want to argue ourselves out of the possibility of something better, even if even if we're angry and frustrated at the the some of the aspects of the present reality. So yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm I, I, yeah. I think you I think you're right. I, I really do think that this will open the door to a, a better attitude towards um possibly white non-christian refugees even so there's <laughs> that we're going to we're going to we're going to move the needle further than that <laughs> i really hope jane i'm just messing with you but uh so you know what i what i love about you is that you're a lot of different things you know you're a game designer you're a thinker you're a writer but i guess i guess primarily if i were to describe you with one word i'd call you a futurist that's kind of mm-hmm. what we're here to talk about is is the future but I gotta be. I gotta be frank. I'm not exactly sure what a, I, a futurist is, or like how you get mm. into the to the game. Mm. I imagine what you do is you like you read the palm of the world. Is that what you do? Mm-hmm. Like you read oh the yeah. I palm. mean, I often I describe it as having your ear to the ground and and <laughs> listening for clues. Yeah. What is a futurist? Tell us what what is that? I would say that as a futurist, my job is to help people imagine possibilities that some people would say are unthinkable because they don't want to think about them, mm. like the realities of of the climate adaptation we're going to have to do, um, or futures that people describe as unimaginable because they just don't believe that that kind of positive transformation is possible. You know, I, so maybe as a futurist, I try to convince people that universal basic income is not beyond the realm of the imaginable, that we could imagine this economic policy being adopted and we can imagine how it would affect our own lives. Or I talk about geoengineering. People can't even think about geoengineering as a possible solution to to climate change Mm. because we don't maybe know enough about it. We don't understand the technology or the science, the risks, the potential harms. You know, if we try to stop some of the solar uh, radiation in order to cool the planet while we get off fossil fuels, that may create uneven temperature changes, flooding in some regions. How can we make it equitable and safe? So I try to help people imagine things that it's it's pretty hard to think about because we've never done it before. We've never lived through it before. And my particular you know, process or methodology is through creating games and, and playable scenarios so people can really visit these futures almost as if they were virtual worlds Mm. where they could look around and say, okay, what's happening? What's the new normal? How do I feel? What are the opportunities? What am I worried about? And we try to bring together tens of thousands of people to immerse themselves in the same scenario at the same time so we can can share our points of view on the future and also maybe get some data about how are people likely to react or feel and and maybe some of the surprising social consequences? So we're not so caught off guard by how people react to unprecedented events. You bring up an amazing example of that early on in the book. And I love that you use these words, uh, uh, unthinkable and unimaginable. And you bring up the fact that in the last two years, Uh, in the news, you traced like tens of thousands of times that those words were used in the media. Mm -hmm. Like this, this action is unthinkable and what happened here is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeking with your book, Imaginable, to imagine the unimaginable. And in 2008, you did a simulation. This is absolutely fascinating. This is nuts. (laughs) 10,000 people worldwide, you asked them how they would react during a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Participants were um, simply to predict how they would personally feel and how they would do in their lives 
uh, with a rapidly spreading outbreak? How would they change their habits? What kind of social interactions would they have? What kind would they avoid? Would they work from home? With a government-mandated government quarantine, what kind of problems would they experience? And under what circumstances would they resist voluntary quarantine and social distancing, et cetera, et cetera? And some really amazing things happened out the other side mm -hmm. here, you know, three, four years later after this experiment. Can you talk us through it? Sure. Yeah. So my approach to figuring out what the future holds is to start with the premise that we are all experts on our own futures. So we can all intuit how we might react in a future event, even if we've never experienced it directly before. So I want to go right to to individuals and say, how would you react? What decisions would you make? So with this 2008 game, Superstruct, we were asking those questions and there were patterns emerging. We saw that the number one reason people would refuse to isolate was religious worship, that it was so deeply ingrained in their mm. values and their purpose. They didn't care if they were contagious. They didn't care if they were you know, exposed. They wanted to go. Um, and so that that emerged in the data then as a real super spreading risk. And when 2020 rolled around and I was starting to, you know, realize that, well, the reality we imagined is actually happening. Some of the first people I reached out to in my network of people who had worked with me at the Institute for the Future to think about the future of worship and the future of congregation, the future of religion, I said, you have to you have to go virtual because people are going to come to your church services are going to come. You to predicted the virtual churches. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, we, we, I mean, our players predicted, right? So, um, I mean, that's the great thing is I don't have to imagine everything. People imagine based on what is most important to them. We had people imagining the future of professional sports and how they would have to adapt in the future of schools. We had moms saying, you know, this is going to be a problem for me if schools shut down how am I supposed to work? I'm probably going to have to take care of my kids. And of course, we saw how many women dropped out of the workforce for, for childcare in the real pandemic. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. In some ways, it's impossible to predict the future. But if we talk to people now about the things we might experience, we can get really useful, actionable data. And beyond that, people who participated in the simulation, and, and I just want to make sure it's clear, they spent they spent six weeks in that particular game, showing mm. up every day, seeing new headlines, you know, how is it spreading? Um, what are, you know, people were experiencing long versions of the illness, similar to long COVID. So they were talking about, you know, how they were trying to think about caretaking for family members who now had a long-term disability. And so every day the story was sort of unfolding and they were reacting to new information. So after six weeks of this, you know, when the real pandemic rolled around, I heard from so many players that they felt just a little bit less shock, a little bit more recognition or pre-recognition. Like they it felt like a memory, even though they hadn't really lived it. And that allowed them to just suffer a little bit less, right? A little bit less of that anxiety and hopelessness because what I always- their ment So their mental health was better mm -hmm. by imagining mm -hmm. what, uh, what could transpire, by imagining the unimaginable. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's because when we run these simulations, we're always asking people to imagine how they would use their skills and abilities and their own voice to try to help others. And I think this was a really important part of- the, the game methodology as we sort of evolved it over different simulations is that when people focus on helping others, it does take them out of that mindset of being helpless and feeling like they have agency. Um, we are often, we can often sort of with less anxiety if we are focused on helping others. And so people had already pre-thought, you know, well, what could I do? What are my strengths? And, and they were ready to act. And so, you know, even though I'm asking people now to imagine futures that they really don't want to think about, turning off the sun, that doesn't sound fun, you know, welcoming a billion migrants, I am feeling not, not excited about that, some people would say. But by thinking through it now and pre-feeling it now, uh, I, I really think we're going to be able to 
face whatever reality we wake up in with more hope and confidence that we're ready for it. Rain, did you know that certain physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress? I did. I did know that. You did know that, yeah. I mean, I, I get I get like weird little uh, rashes on my fingers sometimes when I'm stressed out. And in fact, those rashes are what tell me that I'm stressed out. And also, don't forget about all the doom scrolling that we do nowadays and the, the sleeping too little or sleeping too much, the under-eating, the over-eating. It's all, a, it's all a bit overwhelming sometimes. I can totally relate. I definitely relate to the teeth grinding. And as someone who personally has an anxiety disorder, stress is something I really need to monitor. It's something I need to keep an eye on and uh, practice self-care while undergoing So stresses are just so common these days. They show up in all kinds of ways. And and it's a world that's telling us, Reza, to do more, accomplish more, sleep less, grind all the time. Mm -hmm. Hey, we are offering you a reminder to take care of yourself right now. Do less and maybe try some therapy. Well, I got an idea. What about better help? I love it. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. You could just like do it in your PJs. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Metaphysical Milkshake listeners will get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash milkshake. That's B E. T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash milkshake. And as we always remind you, dear listeners, please take care of yourself. Milkshakers, you know what? It turns out that everything you think you know about probiotics may be wrong. Everything? Everything, Reza. So there's good news. Seed Seeds Daily Symbiotic is the real deal. Not all probiotics are created equal. So what is the Daily Symbiotic? It's a broad spectrum, two-in-one probiotic plus prebiotic, a proprietary formulation of 24 distinct probiotic strains in scientifically studied dosages, proprietary engineered two-in-one capsules that protects probiotics through digestion to ensure delivery to the colon. You know, I've taken probiotics before and I, I've, I've noticed a little bit of difference, but this thing, these guys are right. Like this ad copy, this isn't nonsense, man. They, this stuff really, really works. I've got great gut health. I'm eating better. I'm pooping like two, three times a day. It's fantastic. And I think that's exactly what the symbiotic does. It supports benefits in and beyond the gut. Yes, seed will support ease of bloating, healthy regularity, ease of evacuation, if you know what I mean. But here's what I love about it is that it also supports your gut barrier. It gives you skin health, heart health, and also micronutrient synthesis. Many people see improvements in their digestion within 24 to 48 hours. I certainly did. And that can include bowel movement regularity and eased bloating. Those of you who, you know, live with a partner, They'll thank you for the eased bloating, if you know what I mean. So start a new healthy habit today. Visit seed.com slash milkshake. You can use the code milkshake to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's daily symbiotic. That's seed.com slash milkshake and use the code milkshake. Folks, you don't have to suffer anymore. Another thing that you do, of course, is that you um, look at certain trends, maybe trends that perhaps the rest of us aren't really noticing, or maybe we're so immersed in it that we don't really get it. And then you, by studying those trends, you try to kind of collect enough data to then come up with some kind of future scenario. Is there something like going on like right now that, that the rest of us probably aren't really paying that much attention to, but like you as a futurist are focused on because you're thinking to yourself, well, see, this is a trend that th- that's going to have some major ripples uh, mm-hmm. in, in the future. Anything you want to share with us? And yeah. uh, <laughs> should I get my uh, stockbroker on the, on the phone as well? While we do this? Right. I mean, the, the pattern that I'm most fascinated by right now are patterns around 
what many people called the great resignation. So people during the pandemic yeah. rethinking their commitment to certain types of work. Uh, there's a movement in China called the lying flat movement where young yeah. people, right, are refusing to grind um, for society and, and, and for the government and they just want to do as little as possible. There's the NAP ministry, which looks at rest as a form of resistance, uh, particularly as a form of black activism to, to, to nap and, and reclaim our right to opt out of toxic productivity and capitalism. I mean, there's this These are whole... people without kids. I just want to, I want to emphasize. Uh, oh, no. No, children. no, no. The, to, I, I hear you, but actually, uh, I believe that the founder of Nat Ministry is also a mom and people in this movement, we rest with our children. They can lie in bed with us. They can, they can nap with us. Um, but there is definitely a pattern of, of, you know, I call it the I prefer not to, you know, um, like just we're done with this grind and this constant hustle. That's Bartleby the Scrivener. It is, it is. <laughs> oh my God, I got that reference. <laughs> see how smart I yes. am, Reza? <laughs> I don't even know. Herman Millville's about. famous story, um, Bartleby the Scrivener, yeah, Bartleby. this yeah. guy shows up to work and they're like, uh, can you make these copies? And he's like, I'd prefer not to. And they're like, can you take out the trash? He's like, I'd prefer not to. Can you do these accounts? I'd prefer not to. And he just... He sits there like a weird stalker. And um, anyways, <laughs> but, but it's go ahead, radical, Jane. right? It's it's this like radical resistance. And I do, I'm looking at it. I'm wondering about the possibility of global work strikes. You know, I mean, what is the next wave of social protest and social activism look like? I think there's something coming, you know, with the movement to the four day work week is is also kind of a part of this. And so- I'm looking for, you know, what are the good possibilities out of this? What, what is the friction going to be? Um, what what might support this new world? Um, and uh, and and so, yeah, that's what I'm paying attention to. I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I do, I do think we should be prepared for a refusal to grind. And I am here for that personally. So that's, <laughs> it's so interesting because I literally yesterday. Jane and Reza was having this conversation with my son and he's kind of in his angsty rebellious teens a bit and he gets good grades, but sometimes he just lets his grades just fall. Like he'll all of a sudden be failing a class and then he'll have to like dig himself out of a ditch. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you want to get good grades? You know, why do I need to get good grades? And I was like, well, you need to apply yourself and, and really do the best you can. If you don't get a great grade, that's fine, but do your best. Well, why? And, and why do I need a good grade? And, you know, I couldn't really answer him because in my mm. mind, I was like, does it really matter mm. if he goes to like a top liberal arts school versus a middle liberal arts school versus whether he goes to Santa Monica Community College mm. and delivers pizzas for a couple of years and gets oh some God. life experience and then transfers someplace? Like mm. he's not going to law school, right? He's not going to business school. He's not going to go to med school. So- does it really matter? It's more about the process of living and learning, but this mm. track of, you know, this, and, the, and you feel it in the schools, in the urban centers, especially mm -hmm. this pressure for test scores and grades and extracurriculars to get to the very best college. And I understand that there are uh, economic insecurities out there, but it really does, it does bring into question this whole track that we're on. Well, and you know, I think a lot of young people see the world on fire and there is unfortunately some fatalism too. You know, if we're going to let the planet burn, why bother? Which is not how I want people to feel. I don't know if no. you, if either of you saw, there was a landmark study published uh, by Lancet in the Journal of Public Health at the end of 2021. They surveyed over 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25 from 12 countries five continents. And 56% of these young people said that they feel humanity is doomed and they personally have no future. And the, the top reason why was they were confused and anxious about the failure of government to act on climate change. Mm. And so, you know, while I personally think it would be great to resist through rest and, and opt out of, you know, burnout, culture and all of that, it's also at the heart of it, there's a real despair too that I hope 
in my work to help people address to sort mm. of feel like we there are positive futures still left for us. I don't want half of you know young this next generation half of them feel like they're doomed. That we're all doomed. We shouldn't let that happen to to the next generation. So one of the ways to address this, uh, Jane, is in gaming. You're a big gamer. You were started as a game designer. And there is a correlation here in your book, Imaginable, about predicting the future, how to see the future, um, with gaming and futurism. You know, how, how to think like a gamer and how can that help us? You say, to develop an ability to notice change before it happens, then to have the opportunity to decide what to do in response to that change, amplify it, accelerate it, Resist it or work to prevent it. You also talk about thinking about life, thinking about the future like a game of chess. Mm -hmm. Mm, You know, mm. not being overwhelmed by that infinite range of possibilities because there's like, you know, Google Plex Mm -hmm. number of moves in a chess game, but playing the next best moves and playing out various simulations in your head and and finding a place to go. So how can we, what can we learn from gamers Mm. as we forge our future? Mm, I love that question. So the first thing I would say is that the best metaphor for the future when we're using games as a metaphor is definitely a massively multiplayer game, right? Because every action any of us takes affects what the, the realm of possibilities will be. It's not just two people sitting across each other, you know, over a chessboard. It's billions of people making moves every day. And so, the, you know, the first metaphor that I really want to shift people towards is, is really feeling like we, we're all playing this game together and that we're all making actions every day that determine how the future turns out. Now, there is something at the neurological level that I get very excited about uh, in terms of gaming and how it can change our relationship to the future. So are you, either of you familiar with this infamous study from the 1960s on dogs that created a theory called learned helplessness? It's one of the most controversial American so. studies mm-hmm. um, in the history of psychology. Although I will say my dog is pretty helpless. <laughs> oh, <aw. laughs> um, Probably because you take such good care of your dog. Oh, wow. Doesn't need to be <laughs> help, helpful. Um, so these researchers, they put some dogs through some painful electric shocks And for half of the dogs, there was a little like button they could press when they were flailing around from pain. And if they hit the button, the shock stopped. And the other half of the dogs, there was no button and there was nothing they could do. And they just had to endure the shocks. So that was the first day of the experiment. On the second day of the experiment, they took the same dogs and put them in another torture device. And this one was, um, the shocks were coming from the floor and they had to hop over a little barrier to get to the side without shocks. And the dogs that had found the little button the day before and like, okay, there's something I can do. I can help myself. They jumped over this barrier. And the dogs that had previously had no way to help themselves, they didn't even try. Even though it was just as easy for them to jump over the barrier, they just lay down and took the shocks. And while we would not do this, it would not be legal or ethical to do the study today, it gave birth to this this theory that has was been one of the most fundamental theories in psychology, learned helplessness. If we experience a, a situation or context in which we have no control over the outcome, then we will just kind of lie down and take it in other areas of our lives. And it was used to explain um, depression and, and traumatic responses. But what is amazing is that one of the original researchers on this study, decades later, became a neuroscientist and he went back to study the same phenomenon. And he realized that they had it completely backwards. When you actually look at what's happening in the brain, it actually turned out that the dogs were not learning helplessness. It turns out that we all assume helplessness as our default response to a new adverse environment or situation. And that the sort of deepest hardwired instinctive response to a threat or risk is to freeze. It's like a defensive passive strategy. And it turns out that the reason those other dogs jumped over the barrier is because they learned their own power. And to me, that explained everything I'd ever seen in gaming because gamers have so much 
agency and confidence. You know, in, mm. in, sci- in scientific studies, if you give gamers puzzles that literally have no solution, they will stay there and keep trying to solve it. They're just convinced there's a way I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. Um, and uh, games are this. In, games are basically like a psychological experiment to teach you your power. Right? You're in the game. You're figuring out what can I do, what are my abilities, what are the power ups I can collect. And every time you play a game, you're essentially learning your power. And so that's why I think games are such a helpful tool for thinking about future, you know, worlds we might wake up in. Is we can learn our power before we get there, so that we're not shocked, we're not freezing. Um, which so I think many of us did in this pandemic. Our sort of natural response was like, "Ugh," and we 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 didn't we didn't necessarily act quickly or adapt quickly. So we can so try why, to. Why hmm. is the why is the cliche of gamers that they're in a cloud of bong smoke in their mom's basement <laughs> with their Xbox and in their lives? In you know, in the in their in their fantasy mm-hmm. game, they're slaying dragons and they're shooting yeah. aliens. But in their lives, you know, they're they're working at uh, Little Caesars. You're describing my nephew. No, I I feel we are not describing your nephew. <laughs> I feel I don't know your nephew, but if your nephew is a gamer, I mean, this is you know, outside of my futures work, I I do spend a lot of time trying to um, understand what is the bridge between games and our the rest of our lives? Because some people do kind of use games as an escapist tool and it's like a fantasy for them. But other gamers develop a sense of identity and then they like look around the rest of their lives. Like, how can I... How can I use this creativity or this this leadership skill that I developed or my communication or my ability to handle stressful situations and whatever it is that they feel they're developing in the game? And, you know, it turns out the biggest... Uh, differentiator is just whether people think that games are separate from reality or whether they believe that when they play a game, they're doing something real. Mm. And so I try to avoid um, using language. Like instead of saying, you know, well, what do you want to do in your real life? You know, I talk about, well, your whole life, right? Because games are a part of our lives and we're still the same person when we play and it's still our same brain and it's still our same emotions. Um, So, yeah, I try to I try to avoid that like duality because I I do think most people who play games experience a sense of resilience and uh, and and creativity and it's mm-hmm. better for them to bring that to their real lives than to think that it's an escape from their real lives. Rain, twenty twenty two, man, this is the year that I turn fifty years old, half a century. Holy moly. Pretty soon I'll have to, you know, get like Coke bottle glasses. I might even have to join the uh, AARP. You know, I'm 55 and I've got my AARP card in my wallet because as we get older, we're more concerned about affordable health care, lower prescription costs and protecting Social Security and Medicare. AARP advocates for you and offers financial and job resources, fraud protection, help, information on joining local volunteer groups, and so much more because AARP knows that you have a lot of good years ahead. A lot is is pushing it. You have a few (laughs) few. good (laughs) years ahead. Well, that's what's so important about this. Like, you know, people think AARP is just for old people. But I, you know, it's time to rethink our definition of old, right? I mean, that's right. It can help you with financial planning, retirement, social security resources, and I know somebody who loves the AARP magazine. You know, I love it. It's delivered right to my door. So try the benefits, listeners, yourself. Go to aarp.org/milkshake to join for just twelve dollars for your first year with automatic renewal. You'll get a second membership for free, plus AARP the magazine. And a free gift, an adult diaper. That was a joke. That's aarp.org slash milkshake. One of the fun things about the book, um, Imaginable, is that it's full of games. Like there's there's literally like all these fun little games that you could play to help you, you know, become better at predicting the, the future. And one of them is this uh, turn the world upside down game which uh, both Rain and I were very fascinated by. Can you describe what, what that is real quick? And then maybe we'll play it. Ooh, oh, we can yeah, play, let's play it. Play amazing. It. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is like the simplest habit that you can pick up 
from the book. So you pick a topic like the future of food or the future of books or the future of school, and you make a list of 100 things that are generally true about it today. Like, you know, if you were doing school, you'd say, well, at some point high school ends and you get to graduate, right? You just like list some facts. Like school is a place that you go. Or uh, in school, there's generally like 20 or 30 students per teacher, right? So you write down all these facts that just describe the way the world works. And then you rewrite each fact so that the opposite is now true. So it's like creating all of these upside down worlds. So there are there are 20 or 30 teachers per student. Y- yes, absolutely. And you know, that would be I- in the upside down world <laughs> that you're talking about. Yeah, the upside down world where high school never ends. There are 30 teachers for every student and school is it's not a place that you go anymore, which is actually a, you know, an upside down world we we did many of us lived through. But you do this as a way to kind of unstick your mind about what's possible. And then the most important part is a lot of times you'll come up with these lists of facts that just seem so ridiculous, so absurd. Um, You know, I was doing this with some local uh, government elected officials. So mayors, city managers here in the state of California um, a couple of months ago. And so there were facts like, well, there's a there's a minimum voting age, you know? And so we had, well, there's a maximum voting age or there's no minimum voting age. And it sounds ridiculous, but what we always do with these upside down futures is then we start looking for clues Mm. that these seemingly impossible changes, maybe they're already happening. And it's so easy. All you have to do is go type your upside down fact in Google and see if anything comes up. So, you know, you could go ahead right now and type maximum voting age into Google or Babies can vote into Google. And you know what? There are think tanks and policy centers trying to lower the minimum voting age to zero because they feel like young people have the most on the line in in our current elections and we shouldn't disenfranchise Mm -hmm. people. Um, So it's like this, it's just simple, simple, easy way to expose ourselves to ideas outside of our everyday lives and and outside of our area of expertise. And... um, and so, yeah, it's fun. I do it, I literally do it every week just to kind of keep my mind open to, to ridiculous possibilities. All right, well, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's try I, it. I don't think we have time for 100 facts. Yeah, no, you can, about, do, you can do three or four. Four. How about four <laughs> facts? And how about the topic, something that Rain and I both are you know, involved uh, with in one capacity or another, me far more than Rain, uh, the entertainment industry. Let's do that. Mm. Let's do entertainment. Four facts. Uh, the entertainment industry uh, creates content that are consumed by um, viewers. We experience entertainment primarily through screens. We go to entertainment to escape our everyday lives. We think of entertainment as escapist. Okay, that's three. That's good. Okay, let's reverse it. Um, We go to entertainment not to escape our lives, but to learn more about our lives, engage more fully with our lives. Mm. Oh, okay. You you flip Jane's. All right, I'll flip yours. Um, Entertainment uh, is uh, user-created, user-generated, (laughs) audience-generated. Yes, or you could do AI generated, right? Or Algorithmically AI generated. Yeah, generated. There, isn't a, there isn't an enter- in other words, there's no like a- entertainment industry making group stuff. generated group gen as opposed group to gen- a yeah. handful of elites, you know, yes, on a writing exactly. staff or producers generating it. And then instead of screens, Jane, oh, I've yes, let me let me flip reses because I love I love that one. So I mean, I think this is a totally reasonable prediction. Uh, in the future, we experience entertainment primarily as a as a sound experience, um, and uh, I, I say that only because I know so many game companies that are interested in getting gamers to put the phones in their pockets and to be present in their everyday spaces, getting input from the game primarily through sound. I was a big fan of the, of the movie Dune. Yes. And the soundtrack, I realized that it was the soundtrack that I liked Ooh. more than anything mm, else. Like it was that Hans Zimmer surround sound thumping. Yeah. Cra- mm. he, he created alien musical oh. instruments for it. Mm-hmm. It was really... Uh, it was really insane. I thought you were going to say, Jane, instead of sound, like in the future, 
entertainment will be experienced through the skin. Oh, yeah. So tactile. And it could be through through neurotransmitters. One of the um, research areas that I've been looking at is is neurostimulation. And might we add a component to our our social experiences or our entertainment where, where our vagus nerve is activated to feel vicariously the emotions of others, whether it's others in our social network or characters on screen. Not saying this is necessarily a future I would want to wake up in, but the technology is, uh, is, is definitely being developed. So, um, you know, and it's funny, one of the, one of the simulations I ran, um, uh, this was in 2016, was thinking about would we get on a social network that was primarily neurosensing and was trying to share our authentic thoughts and feelings totally unfiltered, just automatically going out there. And we had 10,000 high school students. Imagine, you know, would you join it? Would you let your parents follow you or would you block them? <laughs> you know, how would it affect learning and dating and activism and entertainment? And, uh, you know, I most people I talk to about this technology think it sounds a little dystopian, like a little black mirror. I can't believe it would be nobody would do that. But man, the high school students were ready for this technology. <laughs> yeah. So it, it did change my uh it, it sort of made me feel like mm, maybe this is more plausible than I was thinking because they really did make a compelling case for why after the age of, you know, filters and curating our lives online, mm-hmm. we might just say, you know, F it. Here's my whole authentic self. That would be a that would be a plot twist. So Jane, uh, throughout this book, now this book, uh, Imaginable, is so wonderful because it 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 takes you, the reader, into this kind of series of games of like, hey, let's imagine the future together, and here's how to do it, and oh, here's practice hard empathy. That's so good. But you do slip a couple of uh, wonderful predictions of your own in there, mm-hmm. and I loved this idea of the medicine bag. Can oh, you give yeah. us a super short synopsis of that prediction? Yeah. So the scenario medicine bag in this future, everybody gets their own personal tote bag with a QR code on it, and they can take it to any farmer's market or grocery store, um, and you can fill it for free with fresh fruits and vegetables because it turns out that if you give people free healthy food, it has such a powerful benefit in terms of preventative health, of preventing heart disease, strokes, diabetes. It is it is vastly cheaper to give away bags and bags of free like oranges fruit and, and apples vegetables. instead of paying for your diabetes. Yeah. And there, you know, there are movements. Like there is a food is medicine movement. There are pilot programs that are doing this. You know, it, it sounds it sounds unimaginable that like we're just going to, I mean, right now we have such a punishing system. If, you, if you're if you on food stamps, it's so controlling. I mean, the, it, there's so much scarcity baked into our food systems right now. It yeah. sounds ridiculous to imagine this incredible just abundance. I like to think of it as like Supermarket Sweep, a show I grew up with and was glad sure. that it was relaunched. You know, like what would it feel like to go into these environments and know that you can have as much as you want and it's free and that feeling of just abundance and just, you know, give it to me. And one of the things that I try to get people to do with these scenarios is you like take them into reality with you. And it's like your own augmented reality device, like in your brain, you can, next time you're at a farmer's market, you're in the grocery store, look around and imagine that this is all free for you. And how does that change how you eat and how you cook and, Mm. and how you live? And when we, and when, when we can look around the real world and see how it could be different, I really do think that empowers us to find out more about the people who are trying to make things different, the movements, the policymakers, the activists, the, the you know, creatives, engineers. And yeah, so I do. I love that one too. That's, That's fantastic. Favorite. And I, I love especially that it's farmer's markets because then you're in, increasing local farmers. Yeah. You're eating mm-hmm. locally, which is such a big part of the food movement. Yeah, I love it. Sign me up for that. But uh, this gets to something, you, this prediction gets to something that I just love about your work is that there's a positivity here mm-hmm. that isn't, um, hey, everything is going to be great, you guys. It's it's not an abject kind of uh, oppressive positivity. <laughs> you know, some people are like, hey, just stay optimistic. And it's like, no, we, 
that it doesn't work. And it also doesn't read as sci-fi too, which I really, you know, like sometimes you, you sometimes there are these uh, futurists you see all the time who are like, we'll have chips and it'll take mm-hmm. care of all disease. And I'm like, okay, but what about like the next few years? I mean, can we talk about right. it? Yes. Well, right. you know, a lot of futurists are, or describe themselves as techno optimists, like, mm. well, technology will solve everything. And I, I feel like I'm more of a socio optimist. I believe that humans will solve everything through our fundamental ability to, to make change for the better. And uh, and so I, you know, I do. There is that fundamental optimism, but it's it's paired with urgency. You know, like the the technology is not going to save us. That's We're what I wanted to ourselves. get to because you you have. A couple of phrases in this book that really popped out to us. One was this hard empathy. Mm-hmm. And I love that idea of like, there's easy empathy. Like you see a video of a kitten with a hurt toe and then it gets nursed back to health. You're like, oh, mm. that's easy empathy. Hard empathy is like, oh, there's a white supremacist who lost his family in a in a fire or, or something. And it, it's really hard to relate Something that's harder to relate to, to mm. practice that empathy. But but hand in hand with that is, you were talking about optimism, but you talk about urgent optimism. And I love this concept. Uh, you talk about it as having a psychological flexibility, a realistic hope, an agency, and an efficacy to impact how the future turns out. Talk to us about the necessity of urgent optimism. Mm, yes. So... You know, urgent optimism, it's a balanced mindset, right? So it's a combination of of positive imagination and shadow imagination. It starts with being willing to acknowledge the the risks that we face, the injustices that exist, and we're not afraid to talk about it or think about it. But it's also paired with the ability to identify and learn about the new policy ideas, the new technologies, the new social movements, the things that can give us hope that we can we can prevent those risks, we can we can solve those injustices, that we can resolve conflicts through these these reasons for hope. And tr- and you know, as a futurist, it's this constant you know, yin yang, it's like, we got to worry about some stuff, but like, wow, there's so many amazing people with all these creative ideas and this passion to make things better. And so we try to hold them both in balance. So we feel like it is our responsibility to act and make the future. We don't want the future to just happen to us. We're not going to let the future just happen to us. We have to find all of the levers that we can, you know, press that might make things better. You're really talking about urgent optimism as a cure for learned helplessness, aren't you? Huh. Well, exactly. Yes, it's it's trying to find our power to make a better future and and to to help others find their power so that we can we can imagine a world we actually want to wake up in and then make it right. Then really make it. Well, Jane, uh, you are the only guest that we have had in our, I don't know, coming up on like 60 or 70 episodes of uh, The Metaphysical Milkshake, who is actually looking forward to the lightning round. And I'm assuming <laughs> I'm assuming that's because you're a futurist. And, and I've predicted all the you've questions. You've predicted yeah. that you're all, yeah, you're going to do well in this uh uh, it's well, also because I've always dreamed of being on a game show, and this is this, <laughs> this is truly is close, think, I've yeah. never been. So this is well, my this is my game show moment. Interesting fact: for every question you get right, you get some groceries. So this will be <laughs> <laughs> experience for you. Okay, are you ready? Uh huh. Here we Lightning go. round. What three items would you choose if you were stranded on a deserted island? Hmm. Um. And I assume we can't just pick my husband and my two kids. No, well, do you think of them as items uh, for, your, at, for your disposal? Because if so, then yes. Yes. Actually, I would not want to inflict that suffering on them. But I would bring a device that I could play Tetris on um, to, to help me deal with the trauma of the situation. And I would bring um, some uh, candy, sugar. Candy and Tetris. Candy and Tetris. <laughs> Are you 11? <laughs> Yeah, wait a Seriously. <laughs> wait a minute here. That's exactly what my 10-year-old would say. <laughs> What's one tip you can give parents that you think would help with their children's happiness? Oh, oh my gosh. If your child loves a game, 
ask them, what does it take to be good at this game? So that you can understand better the skills and strengths that they're building and you can validate that they are real and that you see them, that you see what is good in them when they play their games and not just whatever you, you know, your anxiety about games, that you actually see what's good in your kids when they play. I love that. What's something that a lot of people like, but that you can't stand? I would say most popular music. I have absolutely terrible taste in music. I've been told my whole life. I mostly like, you know, Toto, Devo, and Broadway musicals. And Toto. other than that, I'm really not. Wait, 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 not, wait, 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 wait. No, wait. Toto has another In 1982, song. <laughs> the people who listened to Toto did not listen to Devo. True. You can't listen. You can't okay. listen to Toto and Devo. That's, That's true. That, that does. It's a contradiction there. <laughs> Do you Bad only listen to four four letter bands? <laughs> it could be. Let me wham, love wham. <laughs> <laughs> the cure. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. If you could interview anyone living or dead, who would it be? And what is the first question you would ask? I would like to interview one of the monks at the San Francisco Zen Center. And I would like to ask them about about hope and about optimism. I mean, I would like to have a deep conversation about um, where optimism and Buddhism intersect. That's just something the I would like to The great thing is, yeah. living or dead, that's an, easy, that's an easy get. You can just probably walk in the Zen center <laughs> with a tape recorder. And Unless just- it's a silent meditation or some silent retreat. <laughs> Sometimes we ask our guests that, you know, if you could go back in time and have coffee with like the 19-year-old uh, Jane McGonagall, mm. what would you tell her? But in your case, we're going to ask you if the 69-year-old Jane McGonagall could have a uh, conversation, could have coffee with you currently, what would the 69-year-old version of Jane yeah. McGonagall tell you now? I love that. You know, that's actually a therapeutic intervention that oh. um, it, that for for tr- people who've experienced trauma, uh, asking them that question and they write from their future selves. Um, they will often write stories of meaning, of like a, a sort of how they made meaning or found purpose in in using that trauma to to help others or to change um, themselves or society. So I'm sure I would say something about um, how how much suffering we all have lived through at this time, but that it led to something better and that it created, you know, billions of people who realized that we could change so much faster than we thought and, and felt, you know, felt compelled to make this, this trauma meaningful by using it to make the world better. I think that's what my 60 something year old self Mm -hmm. would tell me. I hope so. What happens to us after we die? I believe that we live on as simulations in the minds of people who loved us, that they can, that we are almost as real as we are, that, that the, that the versions of ourselves, you know, like if I were to try to have a conversation with my husband in my mind, I believe that I could, even though he's not here, I, I know him well enough. I love him well enough that the conversation I would have with him in my mind is almost as real as one I would actually have. So I think we live on as simulations in the minds of people who loved us who are still alive. That's kind of the best answer we've ever had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then last but not least, what is your life's big question? How can we make this more fun? (laughs) That way I would say that is my question. How can we make this more fun? Even the things that are hard, how can we make it more fun? Are you talking about our podcast? <laughs> hey, you guys made it fun today. <laughs> we made we play, it we fun. Play, we play games. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Jane McGonigal, thank you so much thank uh, you, for Jane. coming that was on super fun. Metaphysical Milkshake. This was absolutely a delightful conversation. Uplifting, exciting. Folks, please check out her book, Imaginable. I was going to say Unimaginable. It's unimaginable that you would not pick up a copy of Imaginable by Jane McGonigal. Thank you so much, Jane. You know, for somebody who studies the future for a living, she's pretty optimistic. <laughs> Whereas- I, I, I can't, I can't believe that. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. You mentioned earlier, like the pessimism of so many futurists, of yeah. like AI will destroy us. 
<laughs> they will exactly. have retina scans and recreate you in cloning we will be laboratories. Brains in jars. She really yeah. believes in the the power and the creativity and vitality of the human spirit to make positive change. It's, it's honestly, a, it's amazing. I, I think I think a lot of it has like that game, the uh, the upside down game. It it's sort of hard not to be optimistic when you play it. Let's play it. Uh, let's play another version. Let's play another version. All right. What, what about what are with we gonna podcasts? Do? Podcasts. Pod oh, the future of podcasts. Okay, well, I'll, okay. One fact each. One fact each. I'll start. Okay. Okay. Current. Current true fact about podcasts. Um, everyone and their mother has a podcast or is about to have one. That's okay. My, that's my fact. It's not exactly factual, but All right. I, I see what you mean. Uh, podcasts are an auditory experience. Oh, yours is so much smarter and more interesting than mine. Okay. Um, I, will, I will flip yours around. Well, but I see it'd be too easy to say that it's it's going to be a video experience because it's already a video experience. So I'm going to sure. say that podcasts will be a primarily uh, a um, olfactory experience. <laughs> A smell cast. It'll just be smell casts. Wait, wait. I'm TMing this right now. No, listeners, do not, do not buy smellcast.com. It's mine already. That's fantastic. You could have a, a, a smell cast of, of a 12-course dinner. To turn yours around, everyone and their grandmother has a podcast. I will say that, you know, what about uh, 3D virtual podcasts where you're sitting with the podcast hosts and having conversations with them isn't wouldn't it be like a more interactive podcast? Um, yeah, that's true. Could AI create a version of you and me, put us in a virtual room, and then our milkshakers could come in and have a conversation with us about whatever life's big question we wanted? And the AI, having kind of downloaded our hundreds of hours of talking, would know what we were going to say and how we were going to say it. So you have the experience of like being in the room with Rain and Reza. Milkshakers, you know how this goes. When you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, you get to come on our show and ask us your life's big question. And we have a listener here today, Jared from Georgia. Well, thank you for having me. So, Jared, what do you got for us? You've got a, a life's big question that's, that's percolating away inside? So, uh, with all the news about the metaverse and... You know, I'm not incredibly well versed with it, but it is interesting to me. Mm. At what point does like a virtual currency and a virtual sort of world rival that of our reality? Um, just because that seems to be the main talking point of 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 the ads and of of uh, the meta or uh, Facebook. And I'm just wondering uh, what you think about that. Boy, did you come to the right people? Because Rain is all about the virtual currency. <laughs> he, all, he, he owns numerous cryptocurrencies. I did. I did make some early investments in the crypto that has have turned out pretty well for me. Um, sorry, not to brag, but uh, I was just uh, dabbling. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's such an interesting question. Where are we headed? Um, I don't know if you ever read that book, Ready Player One. The movie was terrible, but the book was really cool. And the fact that people live more and more in an alternative meta universe than they do in the actual universe. But it's interesting because, well, what did we used to do? Like you had a lamb and you would trade it for, you know, 27 years of corn. And that was our first currency. And then we would say, well, this solid gold doubloon here with a crown stamped on it is worth 37 lambs. So, and, and we'll see how that currency fluctuates up and down. Oh, now it's worth 17 lambs. Now it's worth 43 lambs. Um, and so, so that was happening. And then, you know, with the collapse, with the abandoning, as it were, of the gold standard, money simply becomes a number that is tied to a central banking system. Uh, but does it have any actual real value if you have a, $5 bill or a $100 bill is aren't you kind of in the metaverse is there's a there's an agreed upon value to a piece of paper or to a digital number that's in your bank account and now with crypto we're 
you simply abandon that currency being tethered to a, a national bank. And it's just kind of mutually agreed upon. Hey, let's all together just agree that one Bitcoin is worth $41,000 these days or whatever the value is. And then tomorrow it's worth $41. And who, who knows? Um, it can't really be propped up. It can't really be supported. And as we go into the metaverse, and then there's going to be a, the, its own currency. It's going to have meta currency. And there's already kind of all this kind of doge coin and, you know, currencies that were started as a, uh, as a joke. And so it just, it, it, the word meta, it just go, it gets more meta and more meta and more meta as we go. Where does it stop? I have no idea. Um, I don't know that it stops until we go back to trading lambs for corn. <laughs> we might, we might be getting closer to that than you think. Here, first of all, People don't read Ready Player One. If you really want a book about this, read Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's book, which invented the term metaverse. It's an amazing, amazing uh, book. Uh, and number two, look, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a financial guy. I don't really understand economics or business or any of this stuff, so I can't really say too much about, you know, the what what the currency stuff is, except for what, what, uh, my co-host rain, I think eloquently said, which is that all money is fake. All money is fake anyway. So uh, people are like, well, virtual currency is, is so much more fake than real currency. Really? Is, is that <laughs> really? Cause it's all bullshit. It's all just an agreed upon symbol. So who cares whether it's like a piece of paper or virtual, it's all the same. What I think is much more interesting, though, is the way it's going to change the concepts of real and virtual. Like your question was like, well, virtual coins, you know, how will that affect, you know, the the real world? And yeah, the metaverse is a joke right now. I mean, it's like, you know, early, early Atari, basically. Um, but in 20 years from now, you know. I think a much more interesting question will be, what is real? What is real when the metaverse looks exactly like our world, right? When we're not just like legless cartoon figures, but actual versions of ourselves, when we're not locked to a, a you know, a, an iPad or a, or a laptop sitting at our desk, but can actually wear the metaverse with us everywhere that we go. Then I think that we're going to have a much more fun conversation, not about like, what's the difference between real currency and virtual currency, but what's the difference between real and virtual? What is the difference between the two? I was reading a scientist and they were talking about how, you know, we uh, make technological biohacks, like for instance, hearing aids, cochlear oh, implants, yeah. uh -huh. eyeglasses, contact lenses. These are things that what do they enhance yeah. our physical experience in the world, right? Well, that this 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 person was saying that our phone uh, is an extension of our mind. So my calendar is on my phone. I can't remember when I'm doing anything, but it's on my phone. Hasn't my phone become an extension of who I am in a way? And then the metaverse becomes an even deeper extension of who we are. What? You know, like Reza says, what is real? What is not? What do you think, Jared? What do you what are you pondering? It is quite, it is interesting this question what what the nature of reality is it's just because people w w wonder all the time you know whether the life we live in now might be simulated just because of the you know the way that the human body is put together mm -hmm. uh, the way nerves are created it seems like the more we understand that the more curiosity would sort of travel over to those areas where we want to recreate that for some odd reason we love to just keep recreating us, you know, and, and to question what is us, what, what is human, what is our experience and how, how do we sort of study and replicate that? And as our technology progresses it, yeah, it will get harder and harder to, to sort of say, Hey, this, you should really just live in the real world. It's like, well, if my nerves and my mind is sort of stimulated in exactly the same way. And if somehow, you know, they're able to feed me while I'm in the metaverse, you know, then, then the ball game sort of changes, you know? Um, and I'm just wondering, like, will I be after my shift in the real world? Will I work for another four hours, up, you know, in a shop in the metaverse, or 
Or, right. Or, or will that be automated? Who knows? Or, you know, like, will a bot do it for me? You know, those are the interesting questions, I think. It reminds me of that episode of The Office where Dwight was in Second Life. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, are we all going to be living in this Second Life? Yeah. Is the Second Life going to be more real than our real life? I don't know. I bet you anything we've got some listeners who can answer this question for us. Find us on social, at Reza Aslan, at Rain Wilson, and on Twitter, at Meta Milk Podcast. And on Instagram, follow us at, at Metaphysical Milkshake and write us there. That's a good place to reach us, at Metaphysical Milkshake on Instagram. Let us know what you think about what's real, what's not, about the metaverse. We'd love to hear all about your life's big questions. And we really just might put them on a future episode. Jared, thank you so much. This has gotten my mind spinning. Bless you. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, and Colin Thompson. It is produced by Safa Samazadeh Yazd, Paris Lane, Mick DeMaria, Hashem Self, and DJ Lubel. Cast Media is the production and distribution partner. Original music by Jeff Tang. Oh, man, our producer, Safa, just told me somebody already beat us to smell cast. Damn it! Oh, um, no, there's a smell cast? Oh, jeez. Damn it. Look all at right, that. It's thanks, all Safa. happening. Hey, thanks for watching, you guys. For more fantastic videos just like the one that you watch, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.